Welcome to the Demystify Side Podcast. We have Matthias Desmitz on the show today. Dr. Desmitz has been doing some extremely relevant work lately on the idea of mass formation, psychosis, crowd formation, how good people in countries historically have come to do terrible things and developed totalitarian states. And Dr. Desmet has a very distinct delineation between totalitarianism and dictatorships. And I think that's a really interesting place to start. Can you tell us what exactly is totalitarianism and what makes it so absolutely egregious? Versus a dictatorship, which sure. on the surface yes. seems like a very similar thing. Yes, yes. First and for all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and yes, the, 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 the distinction between a classical dictatorship and the totalitarian state is extremely important. And it, and it was one of the questions for me uh, that I asked in the beginning of my book before I started writing it. Like, what is the difference between a classical dictatorship and a totalitarian state? And then I soon understood that... Uh, there is a radical distinction, actually. There is a radical difference. In many respects, the, a, a classical dictatorship is even the opposite of a, of a totalitarian state. Um, and for me, that, that the distinction between the two, between the dictatorship and the totalitarian state, is related to a second question that I asked myself. Namely, why did totalitarian state, states emerge for the first time um, in the beginning of the 20th century, because before the 20th century, there were no totalitarian states. There were classical dictatorships, tyrannies, despotisms, all kinds of stuff, but not totalitarian states. And um, so... What, what question, defines the totalitarian state, though? Like versus... Totalitarian, uh, yes, a totalitarian state uh, differs from a classical dictatorship uh, at a psychological level in the first place. A classical dictatorship is emerges according to a very primitive psychological mechanism. In a classical dictatorship, there is just a small group, a dictatorial regime, uh, that uh, exposes such a, or, or that, that has such an aggressive potential that people are so scared of it that they accept that it, that they accept that it imposes uh, a social contract one-sidedly. So the dictator just says what he wants the popula population to do, and the population accepts that because they are scared of, of, the, of the dictator and his regime. It's as simple as that, actually. Classic top-down sort of, you do what I say, and yeah. since I bring you the food or whatever, you go with it. Yes, yes, yes. Or if you don't do it, I will kill you or at least uh, imprison you or something. Uh, something like that. It's as it's, it's, it's easy as that. It's very primitive and simple. Uh, a totalitarian state emerges in a completely different way. And a, tot a totalitarian state is based on the phenomenon of mass formation, crowd formation, which is a very specific kind of group formation. A group formation, it's a kind a mass or a crowd is a kind of group which is which shows very specific characteristics. For instance, in a mass or a crowd, people are radically incapable of taking a critical distance of what the groups believes believes in they are completely blind for every counter ar arguments or counter evidence against what they believe in that's something extremely typical and it really uh, takes absurd proportions for instance um, well, there are many historical examples of this extreme blindness of people in a crowd and the extreme blind blindness uh, is both there at the at the, uh, in the in the people who are in the mass formation or in the, or, or in the people who are in the masses in the crowd, but they so, but also the leaders of the masses are extremely blind. That's very typical. So, it, but it's, it sounds like it's you're saying it's a bottom up sort of situation where the crowd is in charge and they're hyper uncritical about their own attitudes towards what towards their ideologies or. It's sort of like the difference, if I just make sure I understand this, the difference between the, the classic dictatorship and totalitarianism is something like uh, bottom-up versus top-down. Uh, you think of a totalitarian being this like strongman situation, but the, but the, the, uh, the 
The reality of it, it suggests that the strong man emerges from the will of the crowd that believes so heavily in something. Something like that. You know, it's, I think it's a little bit more accurate to say that the point of gravity of a totalitarian state is in the crowd. So it's also like there is also like a top down influence of the leaders of the masses, but the point of gravity is in the crowd, which means, which implies, while, while the point of gravity of a dictatorial regime is in the elite, in the dictatorial regime. And that, that you, you can easily observe that uh, in the following way. If in a dictatorial regime, a part of the regime is eliminated, the, reg the, the, the dictatorship usually will collapse. But if in a totalitarian state, a part of the regime is eliminated, it will just be replaced and it will be continued as if nothing happened. That was what Stalin, for instance, perfectly realized. He realized that he could, without any problem, eliminate 60% of his communist party members, that they would just be replaced and that the system would go on as if nothing happened. Because the point of gravity in a totalitarian state is in the crowd. It's in the crowd that a crowd, a large group of people, usually about 30% of the population, who is in the grip of a certain ideology and a set of related narratives. That's typical for a crowd. In a crowd, everybody believes in a certain narrative and becomes completely blind for everything that goes against that, that is in, 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 in contrast, in conflict with the narrative. And in a crowd, there are two other very specific, remarkable characteristics. In a crowd, people are willing to, to radically sacrifice all their individual egoistic interests. Very, very strange. And the third very remarkable characteristic is that a crowd is always inclined, a mass is always inclined to commit cruelties towards those who do not go along with the crowd. And they typically do so as if it is an ethical duty to do so. That's extremely typical. Those three characteristics are very typical for a mass. And indeed, that's what's happening. So in every uh, uh, a totalitarian state, before a totalitarian state emerges, the first is a large scale process of mass formation in society, a period in which a part of a population becomes fanatically convinced of a certain narrative or a certain ideology. And subsequently, helped by a few leaders, the crowd takes control over the state uh, system. And then that's the moment at which a totalitarian state emerges, which means a state that has an extremely powerful impact on private life, just because, because they have a huge secret police, namely this segment of the population that is fanatically convinced of the narrative. Almost in every family, there is at least one member that is so fanatically convinced of um, of the state ideology that it is willing to report every family member that does not go along with the, with the ideology. A few weeks ago, I talked to a, a woman from Iran, Shorek Feshtali, and she she uh, she lived in Iran when the uh, when the, re the revolution happened in 1969, I think something like that, and she has seen with her own eyes. The, the a large part of the population, the upper layer, was forced to, to, to witness uh, uh, such things. She has seen with her own eyes how a mother reported her son to the, to the government and how she hung the rope around his neck before he was, uh, he was sentenced. So stuff like that happens in a totalitarian state because people become so convinced, so fanatically convinced that the state ideology uh, 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 needs to be followed that they are willing to report even the people that they used to love. And and I, I, I want to go back and unpack this just a little bit because you've just said so much. And before before we get into the details of those those things that that make the ground fertile for mass formation, this is I want to reiterate that this is a new thing that's sort of emerged in the 20th century, and that. Your argument is that it's not really a stable system, whereas dictatorships in the past, say ancient Egypt, could stretch on for up to thousands of years. It seems like there's something particularly 
uh, ineffective and cruel and to be avoided about totalitarianism. Now, you mentioned that 30% of the population is willing to buy into some state ideology at any given moment, but that's not a majority. So what... Yeah, like it's hard for me to imagine. I mean, so if 30% of the people are willing to buy into the state ideology, does that mean that 30% of the people can become the mother that hangs her own child? Or is there some gradation where there's only a small percentage of people that are capable of falling into that trap? I don't know. The 30% that really buys into the state narrative is really in a state of hypnosis. Mass formation is exactly the same, technically speaking, psychologically, technically speaking, as hypnosis. I Maybe I will explain this later on. If, 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 if. It's really interesting that you say that. I don't know if you've ever watched. And I, so I, I'm, I'm agnostic about what sides of, because I, I feel like in the United States, at least, there's two sides that are both building their own Hip, fractions. Hypnotic of, trances. Yeah, but like w recently one of my friends showed me a Tucker Carlson clip. And I don't know if you've ever watched it, but the man is clearly a hypnotist. He doesn't blink. He's literally like his face takes up most of the screen and he just in this like very melodic voice unblinkingly is staring at you and telling you about what you should be afraid of. It's it, it's it's a magic trick. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, some, uh, yes, indeed. I, I also think there is a mass formation uh, and a counter mass, mass formation in our in our society and both. Well. That leads to polarization, I think. But then, and the, technically speaking, it's exactly the same as hypnosis, exactly the same. And that means that the 30% that are really into the process of mass formation, uh, most of them will be willing to sacrifice their selves because mass formation is always intrinsically self-destructive. And that's why it never stretches on very long. That's the, exactly the reason uh, uh, a classical dictator can be a good leader, actually. He can be someone who, if he... Uh, is a little bit loving towards his population and uses his brains. He can uh, classical dictatorship can last very long, uh, but uh, uh, um, a totalitarian state and mass formation always destroys itself in a relatively short term. So uh, mass formation has existed. It's, it exists as long as mankind exists. Mass formation, but the masses tended to be rather small and short-lived, and. The, 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 one of the questions that, that, that really was central in my, in my book, uh, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, was why did mass formation and crowd formation became increasingly strong throughout the, the last few hundred years, throughout the last three centuries, let's say? And why did it last longer and longer and longer? Because from the 19th century onwards, scholars uh, studying mass formation uh, uh, observed that the phenomenon uh, became increasingly powerful, and Gustave Le Bon uh, wrote in his book uh, *The Psychology of the Crowd* in 1895 already that if things continued uh, uh, in this way, the masses would become so powerful that they would be able to take over control over the state, and that's exactly what happened about 30 years later. So it was a very prophetic uh, uh, utterance of uh, of. Um, of Gustave Le Bon. So, but indeed, uh, the process of mass formation became increasingly strong and it has everything to do with the industrialization and the, uh, of the world and with the, with the excessive use of technology. Uh, so first you had this, the rise of mechanistic thinking, the, 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 the view on man and the world, which believed that the universe is a kind of a mechanistic uh, a machine, is machine-like. Uh, and that leads to excessive industri industrialization and uh, use of technology, also the mechanization of the world. And that in its turn makes that people feel less connected to their natural and their social environment. And it are exactly those people that feel disconnected, so -called social, the so-called atomized people, to use a term that Hannah Arendt and the Frankfurter Schule used, it are the so-called atomized people that do not, who do not longer resonate with their environment that are very sensitive for mass formation. The higher the percentage of uh, isolated people, um, uh, the more powerful uh, the phenomenon of mass formation. So that is very typical. And if you look at what uh, the state of, the, of, the, of society just before the corona crisis, then you could see that the percentage of 
uh, isolated people, lonely people, was extremely high. It is estimated somewhere in between 30 and 50 percent of the population worldwide reported not to have one meaningful relationship and uh, connect to others only through the internet. Almost unbelievable, but it was a Gallup World poll that uh, that observed this. And some in the in the in the United Kingdom, for instance, Theresa May appointed a minister of loneliness because she recognized uh, the proportions, the extremely large proportions of the problem of of social uh, of loneliness. And also in the United States, the U.S. Surgeon General mentioned that there was a loneliness epidemic just before the Corona crisis, and that's exactly the core characteristic of a population that is ready for large-scale mass formation. You you would expect loneliness to come inevitably as technology develops because people are drawn to the promise that technology offers, right? I, I'm often in this, I'm often in this place where I... I recognize the damage that technology is doing because, you know, you can talk to anybody around the world, but you are still not connected to people that are within your local sphere. And for some reason, that's important. And I don't totally understand why. It seems like it makes people want to want to belong to something, whether it's an ideology or a, a political structure or something. It, it, it's like it, if they can identify with you know, something bigger than them that's happening. Like, because you still have this only 30% of people, if only 30% of people are likely to believe in an extreme state ideology, they have to recruit the other, at least majority, like 30% more of the population somehow. But for, So what I'm yes. seeing right now is that much of this recruitment is happening on the internet. And my my question is, why is it that it is, why is it that it happens on the internet, but not in person. What is it about in-person relationships that would decrease this versus the isolation of the internet that would increase it? You mean increase the, the process of mass formation? Yeah, increase the isolation and this this clustering and this, oh, this yes, push yes. towards... It? Yes, yes, yes. That's uh, Well, in my book, I, I give several examples of how uh, even the, the use of... Uh, mechanical devices uh, leads to a certain isolation of the environment, but definitely uh, the, digi the, the digitalization of conversations of human interactions. That's very clear. I've, I've, I've been studying uh, real interactions with my research group, um, research team at Ghent University for 15 years now. We audio tape uh, conversations, for instance, between therapists and patients. We, just, we transcribe them really in, in detail. Uh, and like, for instance, a transcription of one sentence often takes more than one page. It, it lasts, it takes like one day to transcribe one sentence with this system of transcription. And it showed me, this kind of research showed me how extremely subtle and, sub, and, su, and sublime um, uh, real conversations are. For instance, in a real conversation, people react to each other in less than 0.2 seconds. As a point of comparison, Reaction time in traffic is at least one second. So it's it's more than it, it takes more than five times longer in traffic to react to something than in a, in a real conversation. For instance, if one person stops with speaking in the middle of a set, if one person stops with speaking, the other usually con, uh, starts to speak in less than 0.2 seconds, and that even happens if the first person stops his speech in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> so it's extremely strange. And the reason is, the reason is that in a real conversation, when, when people are physically present and they talk to each other, uh, the bodies of the, two, of, the, of, the, of the two persons constantly resonate with each other. Like the, 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 the same, the muscle tension in one body will copy the muscle tension in the other body. And also the, the neurological system will constantly resonate with, e with each other. So the two bodies are... And hypnosis exploits this as far as I understand. I, I'm not a hypnotist or anything, but from what I understand, there's a lot of body uh, gesture matching and things like this. We that... went through a phase where we watched a lot of hypnosis. <laughs> That's possible. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. But uh, You know, through this resonance in one way or another... Um, satisfied like a very old, profound desire of the human being, the desire to be connected, mm. to be physically connected with someone else. And it's exactly this in a digital conversation, this direct 
resonance of the bodies is not there. It lacks. I'm I mean, people, but so f I have this tendency to blame the technology for what is happening and for the, the polarization and the cleavage of societies. But in a place like the Soviet Union or communist China, they were technological, but they weren't what we have now. But st and yet it still was fertile ground for it. Yeah, yes, of course, of course. But they, there were, yes, that's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good question. But even then, uh, most scholars such as Hannah Arendt uh, and uh, and the people of the of the Frankfurter Schule uh, already already concluded that it was a so the 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 it, it was social isolation that was the uh, the the reason why uh, mass formation became so powerful. So even then, and we should take into account, of course, that the industrial revolution really prepared the ground for mass formation. I think even some even something like the simple use of a watch. This, to a certain extent, eliminates or destroys the connection with our environment. When you don't have watches, you constantly have to look at natural cycles, such as the sun, the stars, the moon, and so on, uh, every, and all kinds of other natural phenomena, to be able to, 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 to know or to, to, to situate yourself uh, uh, in time. And that's what, as soon as you wear a watch, you don't need to be in touch with the natural environment anymore. And we can think that this is only a minor detail, but it is not true. If you would observe, if you would, if you would project the stream of consciousness as it flows through uh, uh, our mind constantly, before and after the use of watches, you would see that after the use of watches, it is radically different. From then on, uh, the stream of consciousness, all the, the, the mental representations that go through our mind and through our head, uh, contains much less images of uh, the nature around us, for instance, and the use of, like, uh, the steam engine and, and so on. I, I give several examples in my book. The mechanization of the world disconnected the human being from its natural and its social environment, even in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, when the first totalitarian systems started to emerge. And now the problem is even much, much, much deeper. Uh, Do you imagine that it could be remedied somehow in an integrative fashion? Because it's unlikely that people are going to be willing to give up their clocks. But could they have clocks that grounded them more? Or is there a way to restore connectivity? Between? Do you, do you imagine that there's a prescription to be given for this? Is there a way that we can live our lives while integrating the better technological solutions in a way that doesn't make fertile ground for totalitarianism? Probably, probably, because technological devices are very useful, actually, and in particular to to uh, transmit information. So, in uh, language and, has and to ways. make life good. Not to interrupt, but I was I saw a photo the other day of like a traditional Finnish hut, and you know it's mm. a log cabin, absolutely gray inside, and there's a huge hearth, and the hearth is really it's like putting smoke into the cabin and the roof of the cabin is filled with the smoke and there's just this like bent over woman knitting and i'm like i love the idea of de-technologizing but then you see a photograph of what that actually looks like and immediately i'm like i don't want that <laughs> yes yes no i don't think we really have to go back to uh to uh, to medieval times or something I, th I think we just have to become aware that maybe technology and, uh, and industrialization and the mechanization of the world makes our life easier at a certain level, but it also takes something away of us. It comes with a price. And if, as soon as we really understand that, as soon as we really are aware of that, that at the psychological level, uh, uh, it takes something away, I think we will find our balance. And, and our balance, that means that maybe we will use technology maybe for like 10% of what we use it now. And that will be enough to make our lives more comfortable without ending up in, a, in an isolated uh, way, without losing our resonance uh, with, with nature around us and with other people. I think that's the, the big challenge. And because you can definitely see, that's what I, uh, what I described in my book, how social isolation is the first step. But then once people feel socially isolated, once they feel disconnected, they start to experience they start to develop more and more experiences of meaninglessness because it is exactly the impact we have, the effect we have on the other 
that gives us the impression that our life makes sense. If we see that we touch someone, that we make someone happy, or that we just that the other just notices it, that we have an effect on the other, we spontaneously will have the experience that our life makes that our life makes sense. Without this effect, we will be confronted often without realizing that the connection between the two, but we will be confronted with feelings of lack of sense making. And then in a third step, and that's very problematic, we will start to experience feelings of so-called free-floating anxiety, frustration, and aggression. We will be confronted with negative effects, negative emotions, such as anxiety, frustration, and aggression, of which we don't, by, which are not related to a mental representation, meaning that we will be anxious without knowing what we are anxious for. We will be fr will feel frustrated and aggressive without knowing what we feel frustrated and aggressive for. That's the last, the ultimate consequence of, uh, of, of social isolation and lack of resonance. And then, once the population is in this state, it's ready for mass formation. And then you see how dangerous it is if a large part of the population stops resonating with its environment. It's as if at that moment, something might happen that is extremely simple. If at that moment, a narrative is distributed through the mass media, indicating an object of anxiety, and at the same time, providing a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, something very specific happens. All this free-floating anxiety that is extremely aversive because if anxiety is without representation, if you're anxious and you don't know what you're anxious for, you cannot mentally control your anxiety because you don't know what you're anxious for. And at that moment, when someone disseminates a narrative that indicates an object of anxiety and the strategy to deal with that object of anxiety, all this free-floating anxiety connects to the object of anxiety and there is a huge willingness in the population to participate in a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety. That is the beginning of all mass formation. In the Crusades, in the French Revolution, during the witch trials, uh, in Nazism, in Stalinism, the object of anxiety was always different, but the mechanism was always the same. If a population is confronted with anxiety without knowing what it's anxious for, provide an object of anxiety, and you will be easily able to convince people to participate in a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety. That's the first step. And then the second one happens. Because all these people at the same time participate in a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, people feel not isolated anymore. They have the feeling that there is an, a new social bond emerges, but the new social bond, this new group, this crowd or this mass, is not connected to each other because all individuals are connected to each other, among each other. No, this new group is formed because every individual separately feels loyalty is connected to the collective. That's extremely important. Extremely important because it's even the case that in a mass, the bonds, the social bond between the individuals deteriorates step after step. And that's why totalitarian state and mass form and masses always end up in a typically radically paranoid atmosphere. The social bond between the individuals is completely destroyed after a while. This can happen intentionally, as Stalin did, but it can also happen spontaneously. In Nazi Germany, Hitler didn't try to destroy the social bond between individuals, but it happens spontaneously. It happens in every group with a very strong group bond and group identity. And it seems like it actually does solve their problem in a way. If, if it does address, if by being able to identify with the group all of a sudden, people have actually solved their anxiety problem. Well, there is a, there is a difference between a crowd or a mass, or a mass and, and other types of groups. That's the point, I think. I think that's where we stopped, like that in a, in a, in a, in a mass, uh, uh, a crowd or a mass is not formed because all individuals are strongly connected with each other. Uh, there is no such a thing as a solidarity between individuals in a mass. There is a very strong solidarity of every individual with the collective. And that's the reason why um, totalitarian states typically end, end up in a, in a situation in which 
there is a radically paranoid atmosphere uh, among the citizens and the citizen and, and 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 that the citizens are, are willing to report each other to the government uh, um, no matter even uh, on the slightest suspicion so and that's also the reason why during the corona crisis uh, there was such a fanatic solidarity um, that got a grip on society but at the same time if someone got an accident on the street uh, you were supposed not to help that person unless uh, you had uh, surgical gloves and surgical mask at your at your disposal. At least that was on the website of Belgium, Holland, and the European uh, government. So that shows us something. That that shows us something. It's it's not a solidarity between individuals. In a normal state, people would never accept that they cannot help each other if someone has an accident. Now they did accept, or even more. If you but by undermining their neighbors, they are sort of reinforcing their bond with the group, and that gives them. A reduced feeling of isolation and rewards them for yeah. behaving this way, which is actually quite antisocial in reality. Yeah. Exactly. I could give several examples which which show that show very clearly that the solidarity in during the Corona crisis, just like in any situation in, uh, with mass formation, was not a solidarity between individuals, not at all. The solidarity between individuals dropped away, it diminished, and while the solidarity of the indiv individual with the group. Uh, uh, became increasingly strong and extremely strong. So um, that's the problem with mass formation. So it starts from social isolation. It starts from a lack of bond between, a lack of bond between individuals. And as soon as the mass formation starts, it seems as if people are connected again, but in reality, they are not connected again. <laughs> they are connected to the collective. That means that after a process of mass formation, the social isolation, the lack of bond between the individuals is even, uh, the bond between individuals deteriorated even more. And that means once one mass formation ends, a large scale mass formation ends, society is usually, usually ready for a second one. <laughs> Just because just because the precondition, the social isolation, is even more fulfilled after the mass formation than before. I mean, it's interesting because from my experience with Soviet Russia, my, we I emigrated with my parents when I was a kid, but you know they have all the stories of, of what it was like to grow up in that environment. And from what I've seen after the, the Iron Curtain came down and the Soviet Union ended was that it's not like Russia got back up on its feet and all of a sudden was, was free to, to leave this horror behind. What you ended up getting was that you ended up getting a, basically another totalitarian takeover. But that didn't happen in Germany. No, but there were several differences between Germany and the Soviet Union. The, the process of mass formation went much further in, uh, in the Soviet Union than in Germany, for instance. In Germany, it stopped actually somewhere in the middle. Uh, in Nazi Germany, the war destroyed Nazi Germany before the process of mass formation could go all the way. For instance, in the Soviet Union, first in a, around 19... 30, uh, Stalin started his large purges, which, through which he eliminated, well, nobody knows exactly how many, but uh, probably over 30 million people. Um, according to uh, Solzhenitsyn, who you probably know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote this wonderful book of the Gulag Archipelago, uh, Stalin killed about 80 to 90 million people, somewhere in between 1930 and 1938. And uh, it typically started in the following way, very extremely important. The cruelty started as soon as the opposition stopped to speak and publish in public space. And that's exactly because totalitarianism is based on mass formation. And mass formation is a kind of hypnosis. And hypnosis is always induced by the voice. You, by the by voice a, single, a single voice. A unified voice. A unified voice, yes, absolutely. A single voice, yes. That's the, and if, if there is another voice, a dissonant voice that continues to speak out, you will see that the hypnosis is always disturbed. So hypnosis, really, technologically, technically speaking, mass formation is a kind of hypnosis. So what happens in hypnosis is the following. Someone 
withdraws the attention and the psychological energy from reality, from the environment, and focuses all the attention on one small aspect of reality. That's what the hypnotist does. And this mechanism of the focusing of the attention, the attachment of the attention to one small part of reality is extremely strong. It's so strong that you can perfectly perform an open heart operation when a patient is under hypnosis. So that's what happens all the time in university hospital here in Belgium. Uh, hundreds of surgical operations are performed using hypnosis. It's a very simple procedure through which a hypnotist focuses the attention on something positive. He typically tells things like, we will go to get to the patient, such as we will go to a place where you feel very good. Do you feel the sun on your skin? Do you feel the sand under your feet? Yes. And then suddenly he, the hypnotist gives a sign to the, to the surgeon and he can start to cut through the skin, through the flesh, even straight through the breast, breastbone to perform an open heart operation. So that's the power of this mechanism of the focusing of attention. In mass formation, exactly the same happens. Exactly the same. First, all the energy uh, uh, detaches from the environment and that or all those free floating anxiety, frustration and aggression that's freely floating, it's no longer connected to the environment and then there is this narrative for instance the corona narrative that focuses it all on one point of reality, all the anxiety is connected to the virus, all the frustration and aggression to the anti-vaxxers and so on, it's all focused at one small part of reality and consequently, just like under hypnosis you can take everything away of the population. They will even not notice it. That's because the psychological energy is connected to this one small part of reality. That's exactly the reason why these people become completely insensitive to, uh, to all critical counter-arguments. Just because these counter-arguments use mental representations that are not within this small field of attention. And that's why... The counter-arguments have no psychological impact at all. So, It seems like there is one critical difference, though, which is that people under hypnosis generally won't cause harm to, to other people. Is that correct? They will not. Uh, they will continue to, to stick to the same ethical rules, ethical principles, as they use when they are awake. That's true. So you have to rewrite the ethical rule. The, the ethical rules have to be re rewritten underneath them in a sort of but public fashion. Isn't, isn't there something to do with dehumanization and creating a group that doesn't warrant the ethical rule? Because ethical I think rules. That's rewriting, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rewriting the ethical landscape is a better way of putting it. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you still have the same rules, but you're like, but these people who are anti-vaxxers or these people who are you know, uh, abortion activists or Jews or whatever, or, whatever, or anti-communist or yeah, yeah. in the yes, case of the Soviet Union. What's typical for mass formation is that within the mass, people stick to extremely strict ethical rules. Uh, so people even uh, show a, an ethical awareness that they didn't show before within the mass, but towards the people who are outside the mass, who do not buy into the, the, the mass narrative, the masses typically become radically cruel as if it is an ethical duty just because they are convinced that the people who do not buy into the narrative show no solidarity, uh, lack citizenships, uh, citizenship, and so on, and consequently should be isolated, stigmatized, and ultimately eliminated. That's, that's, the, that's what happens. Unless, that's extremely important, unless if the people that do not go along with the mass formation, that do not buy into the narrative, if these people continue to speak out, the mass formation will never become so deep that people start to commit cruelties. That's extremely important. In, in, in the 19th century, Gustave Le Bon remarked this already. He said, the people who are not into the process of mass formation will never be able, be capable to wake up the masses. That's almost impossible. But he said, if these people continue to speak out, to speak out in a quiet and human way, the mass formation will not go so deep that the uh, masses uh, or become convinced that it is their ethical duty to commit cruelties to the people who don't go along with them. So that's extremely important. And that's exactly the reason why it was shortly after 1930, when the opposition was silent in the, in the Soviet Union, that Stalin started to commit his cruelties. 
That's oh man, that's think. so re- that's so relevant to right now with the free speech movements and the fact that all of our all of our discussion in the world right now is linked to these internet systems that are controlled by very few people, unfortunately, or at least very few corporations. Mm. How can we spare ourselves that fate? Do you have any in- insight on that? Like, how do how do we how do we keep our our speech free and open? How do we keep these platforms from stopping us from talking about these i agree like if we can't talk about stuff it's just a powder keg you know there's no nothing can work out if we can't talk no indeed indeed so um well the first thing we have to make sure of is that we are really aware of the fact that 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 it has dramatic consequences if we stop to speak out so that's clear in the soviet union 1930 people stopped and the cruelty started in nazi germany in 1935 the opposition was silenced, or at least the opposition went underground because they thought it was too dangerous to continue to speak out. And in less than six months, uh, uh, the cruelty started in Nazi Germany. So, as, so we have to be aware of that. And then we have to do everything to continue to speak out. We should never be discouraged by the fact that we are not capable of waking people up, of convincing people. That's not... I love that. Yeah, it's a really good point. We will not be able to convince them because these rational arguments for the reasons reasons that I just mentioned just don't work anymore. But what we should realize is that it is not because people don't wake up that our speech is without effect. Not at all. If we speak, we will constantly disturb the hypnosis. We will constantly disturb the process of mass formation and we will prevent that both the leaders and the masses become so fanatically convinced of their own ideology that I think, as I said, it is their ethical duty to destroy everyone that does not go along with the ideology. So I repeat this time and time again. In my book, I explain it in detail, psychologically, what we should do and why we should do it. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that this will will be decisive to determine whether or not the group that does not go along with the masses, with the crowd, will be destroyed or not. Strangely enough. It's a a strong claim. I'm aware of that. But don't underestimate the blindness that can seize a mass or a crowd and the fanatic conviction that can seize a crowd, even in our times, if, if there is no dissonant voice anymore. So, well. Uh, but the, but the top-down the- structures are working so actively to shut down dissident voices across the world. But, that's really scary to me. But even then, what's happening is that people are cloistering themselves into social networks that are specific to a certain kind of speech. Right. So you have it used to be that everybody was on Twitter. Twitter started banning people. And now people are on you know, Getter or Parler or all of these places. And you go and you look. And in the same way that Twitter is super left, these spaces are super right. And it seems like we've it. Whereas in a totalitarian society like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, there was one central word that came out. But here, it doesn't seem like there's one central word. I can't model it as being just one. There's a momentary window where, yeah, the Democrats are in charge and they have Twitter, but it's going to flip. We're going to have an election four years from now or two two years from now. It's going to go upside down. Will that serve as a check and balance or is it going to just make a war of two different totalitarian nations, global nations? You know, it seems like there's a potential for both sides in any in this is is there a potential for two can there ever be two totalitarian re- regimes at odds with one another from opposing if, ideologies or is it just that's a same, good balance to have in the same society you mean yeah i mean well, it's if a, you global have a global society, society right now yeah. yeah like we're we're basically a global society to, to some extent we're on our way anyways in, there can be i think there can be two processes of mass formation but usually one will be dominant and uh, and the smaller one will be destroyed always. Uh, so uh, what the, the, the real challenge, I think, for the people who are not in the grip of the first, the large scale process of mass formation is to make sure that they don't end up in a mass formation themselves. That's the real challenge, because if they do, you have a large crowd and a small crowd. 
uh, that both function according to the same destructive principles. And in this struggle between the large and the small, the small will definitely lose and will be destroyed. And then a new counter mass will emerge and so on at infinitum and until. And so what are you, are you optimistic? Yes. I, oh, okay. All right. That's I, good. I think, I think it will be very difficult years, the years to come. So I think definitely in Europe, we will see the emergence of a new kind of uh, totalitarianism, a technocratic totalitarianism. That was what, Hannah Arendt already mentioned in 1951 in her book, uh, The Origins of a Totalitarianism. It's here on a pile of books just beside my desk here, um, next to my desk. So what she mentioned, warned already for in 1951, she said, we've seen, uh, we, we've experienced the fall of Nazi Germany. We will see that uh, uh, the Soviet Union probably will collapse also uh, in the nearby future. Uh, but then she said a new kind of totalitarianism will emerge, will emerge and it will be led uh, by dull bureaucrats and technocrats, she said. No longer by, by, um, by uh, gang leaders such as Stalin and Hitler. So she was already well aware that uh, uh, the zeitgeist, the time spirit would, would evolve and that probably the new totalitarianism would be technocratic in nature. Uh, in many respects, you cannot compare it to the Nazism or Stalinism, I think, but it's, it, that doesn't make it less totalitarian. <laughs> it will also, in a relentless way, impose its ideology to the population, or it will try to do so. And so I guess that we really have our fate in our own hands. If we continue to speak out, we will be uh, banned from the internet, I think. We will be, because it will be easy. Uh, I don't know if, you're, uh, if you know that uh, there is this European digital ID that will be used in Europe uh, probably in a few months to, 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 to maybe one or two years. Um, and this digital ID will be like a kind of QR code as was used uh, during the Corona crisis. Uh, and then it will be very easy to ban the people from the internet who don't have a QR code. It will be extremely easy to do so. So I guess they will try to do so, but of course we can speak in the real world as well. And in a strange way, uh, our words might have more impact in the real world than, world than through the internet. <laughs> so that's 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 extremely important, I think, in many respects. But I, how do I, people I, I, form I'm, those in-person connections? I mean, people are so atomized. People, yes. the the way that this starts is that people are atomized, and mm. if people get kicked off the internet, they're still going to be atomized. Yes, but we will have to reconnect. We have to. We'll, we will have to form parallel structures. I think. We will have to, well, not really, we, will, we, may, we might not be able to really live off grid, but still we might be um, uh, forced to live in a closer connection with nature, more self-sufficient and so on. More of the not Finnish entirely, huts. Not, not entirely, that might be impossible, but to a, cer to a certain extent, we will have to reconnect in the real world, I think. And we will have to find a way to continue to speak out. Um, we might and, be inspired, yeah. And 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 really pertinently, it seems worth remembering that these totalitarian movements burn themselves out. It's almost like they're cannibalistic; they eat themselves alive. Like the people get sick on the flesh of their neighbors. Eventually, I, I don't mean to be so graphic, but it's a really horrifying thing that does seem to destroy itself. Can you can you say something about how these fall apart in the end or what we could maybe look forward to as falling apart in these present totalitarian movements? How yes, there are, there are several mechanisms in mass formation and totalitarianism that make that the system, the, the, ma the, the mass formation itself and the totalitarian state always destroys itself. Hannah Arendt said, the totalitarian state, in the end, always becomes a monster that devours its, its own children. That's how she expressed it. And uh, there are several psychological mechanisms uh, at work uh, uh, in this process. For instance, a mass formation always needs an object of anxiety, always. That's also what George Orwell uh, describes very well in 1984. Once the first object of anxiety is destroyed, the system is in need of a second one. And once the second one is destroyed, they need a third one and so on. 
And that's exactly what we what happened in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, the system started destroying the aristocracy, uh, then the the small farmers, the the large farmers, then the small farmers, the kulaks, uh, then the goldsmiths, then the Jews at, in certain regions, and then suddenly that still made some sense within the narrative, within the state narrative, because all these people. Uh, were too much attached to this to their private property uh, to become good communists, but suddenly the system started to destroy. S Stalin started to indicate ever new groups, and in the end, nobody knew anymore why this or that group should be destroyed. But they did so, the one after the other, just because a mass always needs this object of anxiety that has to be destroyed. Otherwise, the mass formation cannot continue to exist. And the masses, the people in the mass formation, don't want to wake up because if they would wake up, they would be confronted with this loneliness, with this lack of meaning making, with this free floating anxiety, frustration, and aggression again. They would not have the opportunity anymore to channel, to satisfy all their frustration and aggression uh, in the process of destroying the, the objects, of, objects of aggression. So they don't want to wake up. That's for sure. They don't want to wake up. And the leaders of the masses realize that if the masses would wake up, they would attack their leaders and destroy them. That's typically for mass formation. Gustave Le Bon said, if you uh, become a leader of the mass, you better prepare to be hung. Uh, he said, you will definitely be killed once the masses wake up. Um, so uh, both the, the masses and their leaders know that they should avoid waking up. <laughs> so uh, that's why- it's, It also, I love what you, I just want to reiterate what you just said. It's kind of beautiful. The more that we can calm our own anxieties as in our small little worlds and with our neighbors and in our communities that we already have, the more that we can reassure one another that this sense of anxiety isn't real, that it's being put upon us. And the more we can take this into our own hands, the more control we have in the situation and the less likely it is that we will suffer from the oppression of a totalitarian regime. I think that's a really beautiful realization there. How much power we actually have to to stop this comes down to how how not freaked out we we get when we see these top down impositions or this culture of fear that's clearly manufactured. The or more like or the controversy, the most recent controversy, right? So last night I open up Twitter and I see that there's this leaked draft from the Supreme Court about the fact that they're going to repeal Roe v. Wade, and Roe v. Wade in America is the uh, Supreme Court's legislation that legalizes abortion on a federal level, and it's a draft opinion that has been leaked. You know, it's the first time in a century that a draft opinion has been leaked from the Supreme Court, and it's a, it's a huge scissor, right? Because you have all of these people that were already anxious about what was happening in the world. They latched onto the corona crisis. And now you see that as corona crisis has wound down, they were provided with Ukraine. Now that Ukraine has sort of faded from the public attention span because it wasn't as motivating, now it's this, it's this abortion debate. And so you see this constant replacement and people organize themselves on opposite sides of it, where there are some that are pro, some that are anti, but you know that one side will win, and you know that one side will demonstrate that it is more powerful. And so it does seem very much like it's it's occurring. I mean, it just feeds the anxiety, too. Like, it really doesn't matter who... I mean, it matters to me who wins, but it doesn't matter, ultimately, for the totalitarian regime, right? It's just that there's... I think that it's I think that it's largely manufactured. The attention is put on it so that people continue to experience it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that it's entirely top down. I'm saying people love to fixate and try to solve this their feelings of anxiety, which, like Dr. Desnit saying, come from the fact that we're cut off from one another physically. We're cut off from our food sources. We're cut off from the the literally cut off from the woods. We're cut off from the the earth that we walk on, we pave our, like, it's just crazy. We're, we're, we're atomized, like he says. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, indeed. And I think that behind all the different narratives that always indicate new objects of anxiety, it can be the terrorists, it can be the climate change, it can be uh, the coronavirus, or it can be the war in Ukraine and Putin, 
behind all these behind all these different narratives there is one stable factor the ideology that gets a firmer and firmer grip on society is i think a technocratic transhumanist ideology and that's exactly what we see we see a society which becomes more and more fanatically convinced that the only solution to all the problems that we are facing real or imagined that the only solution to all these problems is to reshape society into a technologically controlled society a large internet of bodies as harari calls it um that's the illusion the di- the dangerous illusion we are facing and all these different narratives on objects of anxiety uh, are used actually or have the psychological function i would say it like that in a little bit yes i think they have, it's had have the psychological function of pushing people to accept technological control and and that idea by the way this transhumanist thing is like the idea that medicine and technology can rescue even our own mortality like we can just become gods completely in control of the universe completely in control of our futures of our all, destinies of all our, knowledge too yeah we will know everything we know how the universe started down to the billionth of a second like this this fantasy that it's possible for us to literally dominate the the entire universe uh, is at the heart of this and it's not really it's not substantiated is the thing right how i mean we we can't even you know we can't even cure a common cold let alone can we live forever but the dream is still very real for for the technocrats and it seems like this is a lot of what the new anxiety is centered on, which is sickness and disease and medicine, right? Where the crisis of the last two years has been centered on the promise of immunity, on the process of being able to walk free in a world where you see people worrying about germs in a way that they never had before. You know, they would go they would go into the grocery store without being concerned that they might catch a deadly flu, even though they could every November and December here. And it seems to me that the military industrial complex has become unfathomably unpopular. People don't want to go to war. People don't want to sit in the trenches and kill each other and murder and get their hands dirty. You know, we've left that. What people do want is exactly what you're saying. They want this transhumanist medical future where they will be able to cure all ailments. And you hear people all the time fantasizing. Medically cure their anxiety even. Yeah, like, when will I be healthy? And that's really a shocking development. Hmm. That it is definitely. Yes, we've seen this. I, I think we, it all goes back to the emergence of the of the mechanistic view on man and the world. The idea that the world is like a, you know, a, a, a material machine that can be completely rationally understood, controlled, and manipulated to such an extent that we can even take suffering and even death away from human existence. Um, We actually just talked to somebody who is working on a project called uh, uh, like the elimination of unnecessary suffering. Yeah, the elimination of unnecessary suffering, yes. Yes, that's that's of course what the mechanistic thinking believes it can do, uh, but I don't think it can. Um, I think... uh, even science shows us very clearly that the major part of reality cannot be rationally understood. If you look at complex dynamical systems theory, it shows very clearly in a paradoxical way that uh, complex dynamical phenomena uh, are strictly irrational. (laughs) That's what it shows. It shows that they behave as an irrational number and that they cannot be um, uh, predicted or or, or rationally controlled. So, uh, um, René Tom, I don't know if you know René Tom, one of the most famous mathematicians of the 20th century and one of the, um, the people who invented uh, catastrophe theory and complex dynamical systems theory. René Tom said that part of reality that can be rationally understood is extremely limited. And the rest of reality, he said, we can only know 
by empathically resonating with it. And we have that's that's the kind I'm sure that this the crisis of the, the series of crises we are facing now will only be solved once we as a society we can move from a rational way of understanding as the guiding principle in society to an empathic way of understanding, to a resonating way of understanding. Really, Tom said this in a really beautiful quote. He said, he said uh, 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 the, the, the famous scientists did not distinguish themselves from normal people because they had an extraordinary capacity to rationally understand or to rationally think. They distinguish from other people because they have this uh, uh, exceptional capacity to resonate with the phenomena they were investigating. And that's a totally different way of knowing the world. As long as we try to force the world, other people, nature, into the categories of our rational understanding, we actually constantly mentally destroy the world around us. We reduce it to what we already know. We reduce it to our own system of thinking. And in this way, we become isolated even at that level already from the environment. It's first when we understand that our, with our rational understanding, we can never really grasp nature and the human beings around us, the universe around us. It's at that moment that we can open up, almost literally, open our mind, stop to stick to narrow logic, that we can open up our mind and that we can start to resonate as a string, as really as a string inside of ourselves, almost physically, that can start to resonate with the phenomena around us. That's the moment in which also I, I experienced that in my own life. That's also the moment in which all the ideas about death and suffering become more bearable. You can stand death when you start to resonate with the timeless music around you. That's, it makes sense to me. I'd never... I just experienced that when I started to be aware of the fact that uh, my brain would never be able to really understand the world around me. That, was, that it was at that moment that I could open myself for the mystery of the things around me. And that it was at the same time that I started to resonate with the things around me and that I became capable of thinking about death and suffering without being too scared of it. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. That's, uh, that reminds me of something that comes up on the show all the time, which is that perhaps, uh, perhaps art and music and other aspects of representation are more appropriate for discussing life sometimes than pure science, uh, despite uh, how amazing science can be for understanding mechanism, perhaps that's not the best way to apprehend all situations. And it does seem like transhumanism would pull us away from it. I don't know if you've seen the, there's, you know, AI that make art, they can compose music, they write, and it seems like it pulls us farther and farther away. But this might, this might be fertile ground for a future conversation, because you're working on a book about this exact subject. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I want to discuss the ideology behind the current series of crises. And while in the book I published now, I focus on the process of mass formation and the historical roots of mass formation. And I also talk about the limitations of the mechanistic and the rationalistic view on man and the world. Uh, I want to really go into that in a, in a next book, will which be thicker and a little bit more difficult. But still, I want to really a show that this entire idea of, of this entire transhumanist rationalist ideology will both is both not based on sound scientific arguments and at the same time the risks to destroy the core of humanity in this world and of society. And I'm not saying this in just a way. I, I mean, I can really show why it is the case. And I will do it. I will try to show what the dangers are. Uh, of, of this transhumanist ideology with a lot of historical examples and a lot of psychological examples and stuff. 
but uh, indeed i think uh, i think that's the challenge we are facing now since the start of, of the tradition of enlightenment we really believed that reason rational understanding is what should guide society and guide the human being and that in one way or another uh, turns out to be an illusion which uh, that's what also what what all major scientists came to conclude that they all started from this rationalist mechanist view on man and the world and in the end they all left it behind and they all warned us that it mechanistic think, mechanistic thinking only applies to a very small part of reality and that it is this and that it is and that it does not that it cannot make us understand or make us know and understand the core of human experience and of the, the core of the mystery of the universe and so on um so yes my next book will be about that yes well, I hope you'll I hope you'll come back and talk to us once it's out. That's that's a entirely fascinating subject for us that hits on all of our favorite topics. Um, thank you very much for thank you. Me. Yeah, thank, thank you so you for much coming. for coming out. This has really been illuminating for me. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.